The phenomena that was Bhutto is writ large in many hearts and minds. He was relentless and unyielding even in the days of imprisonment, standing by his conviction to uphold his decisions. He was 51 years old at the time, in the prime of his life, refusing to plead for his life or permitting his family to do so. This was the legacy that he left for his daughter, oldest of his four children, to be strong in the face of adverse circumstances, and Benazir Bhutto rose to the challenge. Benazir Bhutto was born to Nusrat and Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. Her father was from the feudal class of Larkana, Sindh, and her mother, an Iranian, settled in Karachi. Despite the feudal social milieu, Mr. Bhutto was progressive and did not believe in archaic, traditional practices of their class. You have to see that Benazir was a product of a feudal society and that it was really her father who broke away from tradition. He educated his children and he sent them abroad and he taught them to be independent and confident. And that I think is very, very important. And with it, she had a mother also who was progressive. And with that kind of background, she had that kind of vision because she saw the world and she was in the convent here with us in school and then she was in A-levels and then she went to Harvard, she went to Oxford. So, you know, it was only normal because her own father, if you remember, brought women into all the services of Pakistan, you know, except the pa police service of Pakistan. And that Benazir bought later in the 90s. She opened the police service of Pakistan to women. So, you know, Benazir's life really started in the home, not restrictive life, but conservative in some ways. They were very, very keen for women to get education. And she, on her part, people don't realize this, that when she got into this thing because of a very unfortunate incident in her father's murder, she herself was a symbol of that vision, that liberty, that independence that women should have. He was encouraging her and uh, right from the when she was at Oxford. So at that time, they used to, used to discuss different issues. And Bhutto will discuss uh, at a dinner or whenever he has the time on certain issues. And uh, so there, Bibi was very, I mean, in a way, interested to argue different things. So this is how I think it developed. And he found her that she could be his successor. Growing up in a privileged environment, Bibi knew little of the realities and intricacies of political life that she would eventually enter. At age 24, just out of university, she went through the most grueling experiences of her life. Her area of interest was the foreign office. I mean, she was a carefree young person at that time, you know. She had just finished her studies and uh, she intended to probably pursue a career, career in foreign affairs, which was her own father's sort of uh, pet area of expertise also. And uh, I think circumstances pushed her into a position and she faced it. Uh, she was forced into this uh, life. Uh, which she um, sort of, the it was a challenge which she met remarkably. Uh, the thing is she was a very c courageous and brave person, I think, um, and that is true of Mr. Bhutto's whole family, including Benazir's mother. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they're exceptional people. So when the challenge was thrown, the gauntlet was thrown, she took it up and uh, she was a fervent believer in democracy. Her father was a very pervasive influence in her life. Well, he was an all-pervasive influence from childhood. I think he had picked her up or rather picked her out as somebody who was intellectually compatible with him. And I remember as children that uh, the library in 70 Clifton, it was a, sort of an out-of-bounds area, it was a sacred area for him. But of all the children, he would uh, just walk in uh, to the house and pluck her out and take her into the library. So even from that age, he was educating her, telling her about the world. And she was reading books while we were reading comics. So she was that far advanced. Uh, she was always in awe of her father. He was her role, role model. 
And of course, when she came back from Oxford, the coup took place, their lives turned upside down. And then she uh, took on her father's mantle, and he passed his mantle on to her. Uh, she uh, not only fought his cases, uh, she ran from pillar to post, but all the time that she was, uh, he was in the death cell, she would visit him, and that was the time of her political education. So, yes, she was very much her father's daughter. And when her father was arrested, he told her that you are the daughter of a man who can give you everything. You can go abroad and do whatever you like. You have studied at Harvard and Oxford. But she said, no, I will never leave you, and I will do what I think is right. And her father was her inspiration and her guidance. And I remember now, when I think back, that maybe the first seeds of all this were sown when Mr. Bhutto left Ayub Khan's cabinet and came to Karachi, and he was put in jail, and we were in school. She was uh, in grammar school, Karachi grammar school, for one term before she went to Harvard, and she was the youngest person to go to Harvard. She was 16 when she went, and because she had completed her 12 years of education as required by American universities, because class 11, O level, she did in Convent of Jesus Mary, and six months of her first year A level she did, and that completed her requirement of 12 years. And in that term, in 1969 March, uh, they put Mr. Bhutto in jail, so there were all these pictures, party people had printed these pictures of Mr. Bhutto behind bars and we put them on and we thought we were very brave and doing something very good and we were very young. And with another friend of ours, Firoza Pantaki and my sister Salma Wahid, we went to Bandar Road and we stood there trying to distribute the pictures and then we wore them to school and the teacher was very cross. They said, you can't do this because badges are not allowed. When I met uh, B.B. for the first time, it was uh, after the coup, when she had come back from uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard, and she'd been only back in Pakistan, I think, three or four days when the coup took place. My father was a dentist to Mr. Bhutto, but they were supporters. We offered our house to them, and we told them they can come and stay with us. So that was the first time I actually met her. And uh, because I was young and to us, she was the Prime Minister's daughter. We had just arrived and we were a little nervous and we didn't know how to go and sort of greet her. And I went forward and I introduced myself. And, but she was so wonderful that she relaxed me straight away and we started talking to each other. And she asked where I was studying, what I was doing. And uh, from that onwards, our friendship sort of uh, blossomed because she, she lived with us and I became her constant companion. And, we would travel everywhere together, we would, uh, but she was like, if I look back at her life, it was, she walked into politics without realizing how long that walk is going to be, because she was a frail little girl which has just arrived from Oxford with dreams to fulfill, and uh, this horrible coup had taken place, and her father was in jail, and, and she was very, very brave, determined to fight uh, for her father's life, for his case. And uh, she just wore the mantle and we all just followed her and we just went ahead. Uh, my association with Bibi dates back to 1977 uh, when the coup took place. Um, and it was primarily because of my deep uh, feelings about the trial. Um, I had uh, at that time, I remember seeing a movie called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And uh, when uh, the coup was staged and the trial was initiated, I don't know why I drew a connection and I was ready. I mean, it took over me. My whole life was sort of taken over. And that's when I met Bibi. Of course, for her, being her father, not only the leader of the political party and the responsibilities, this was the all-encompassing thing. And it became the same for all of us who were associated with her at that time. Uh, it was a difficult period. Um, we saw her go, go through great tribulations. It was also a period when, unfortunately, um, there were not many people who came forward to be with them. Uh, Dr. Niazi's uh, family uh, here in Islamabad, primarily that was the only home where uh, they were welcomed with open arms and a great deal of support and strength was given to them. The greater part of the following of Mr. Bhutto comprises of very poor people who laid their lives down for him, but they were not uh, in a position to offer uh, support of the kind where they could come forward, be with them or host them or have them with them.
because Begum Bhutto was in charge, but then she was frequently not staying well. Slowly, the mantle was falling on Bibi. And then it just happened. Then she started traveling in the interior. I would be traveling with her or my sister. And um, and then Mr. Bhutto was the uh, case happened. And in March 1978, uh, they, um, Mauri Mushtaq pronounced the death sentence on Mr. Bhutto, and Bibi went to meet him for the first time. And she came back very dignified, and it was late at night, and she was arrested, and I was somehow in the house when she was arrested, so I never went out. I was there for a month. Whenever and whatever opportunity Bibi had, whether in jail or detention, she managed to solicit support of her father. She was very much alone in this effort. Except for a handful of friends, most of the party workers had either been arrested or sought exile because of unrelenting persecution of the regime. If I look back um, at Benazir's life, her whole life was dedicated to her father. She adored her father and Mr. Bhutto adored her. Um, I mean, like you want to salute a daughter like that because all her youth was dedicated to him. She fought, uh, fought his case first, and then when they realized that, Mr. Bhutto realized that he would, he would have to groom his daughter for politics because Yah was going to go ahead with the death sentence. So in that, he advised her to go to his, for her first tour, which took place was in Peshawar, and uh, General Barber accompanied us. I was with her. Her friend Victoria was with her. Uh, Benazir, when she arrived from uh, England, her Urdu was not very fluent. She learned Urdu right in front of us. Her grasp of the language was very fast. She learned Sindhi in front of us. And then when on that tour when we went, uh, Mr. Bhutto had told her that you're going to the frontier where there are people of great honor and their culture is very important to them. And uh, so when we traveled then, we went into small towns like Mardan, Charsada, Swat, Manora, I, was, I, as a child who had grown up in that part of the world, was quite overwhelmed to see the support they had come to give her. And basically the slogans were like, in you know, a brave daughter of a brave father, a valiant daughter for, you know, who was fighting for their life. I feel the Pathans came and saluted their courage. Major factor was that she was the daughter of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, and the establishment was always... Um, uh, suspicious of the Bhuttos, they were afraid of the Bhuttos, they were afraid of the of the Bhuttos populism, they were afraid of the the links that the Bhuttos had amongst the masses, they were afraid of the popularity. So it was a combination of things, A, she was Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's daughter, B, she was a leader who had political clout, who had her roots amongst the people. And because she was a woman, because she was a liberal woman, she stood for the rights of women, she stood for the rights of uh, uh, people at large. So she fought that and we were with her in that. And as we saw her very closely, we saw her extremely closely. And the way she took up that cause and the way she fought it shows, you know, that she was going to be a leader. People just chose her, turned to her for decision making. It wasn't like people keep saying she was Bhutto's daughter, yes, but she also earned her place in history and in politics. She really fought hard and the way we traveled and the way we campaigned with her, she had enormous energy and she had to make decisions, believe me, no one believes this, every second of the day under Ziaul Haq, there were crisis decisions being made, whether she was going into jail or into solitary confinement in jail, or whether she was out of jail. She was not just fighting her cause and her cases, she was fighting her brothers, her sister, her mothers, she was fighting the party people, the party workers. All the time we started the office with her. There was nothing in there, because after Mr. Bhutto's murder, things scattered, you see, and she sort of got us all, she was like, in Urdu say Chhatri, an umbrella. She became an umbrella for all of us and the PTP. And she really kept our morale high. In 1981, she was taken separately to Sakar Jail. And that was the worst nightmare. I think that Sakar Jail was 120 degrees in the shade. It was terrible. And she never felt the heat. I think Mr. Bhutto 
told her do not waste your time when if you get into jail because this is before he taught her while he was alive he said you have to regiment your timing and all to stay all right so from 8 in the morning till bedtime she had a time routine newspapers x time food x time embroidery x time because newspaper she was allowed one newspaper and then she was taken to karachi central jail from there 6 months there 6 months in karachi central jail and she embroidered a cushion for me with her name and when we came back uh, she went for her first meeting to meet ma'am mr bhutto and uh, he said he stood up to greet her and he said i have uh, i'm standing up to meet uh, my daughter who has become a leader he was so proud of her he read all the speeches he wanted to know everything how it went what happened uh, what were the people's reaction what they felt for him so i mean it was now when i look back i felt that you know that was her first journey into politics and and then she never looked back i mean uh, but nobody realizes that uh, the trials which benazir has been through in a personal basis and to to see your father being in the death cell to have to wish him goodbye to have to go to the jail cell and to be told that your father's death sentence is going to take place today i mean would break anybody's heart but the mr bhutto had always told them that uh, the world must never know uh, what we are going through and you must walk very honorably and they must know your pain what you're going through and she had requested me to uh, the food used to go from our home so my mother and i used to take the food to the jail cell before 12 o'clock that day on 4th of april when we took the food nobody would take the food in and we saw a lot of activity outside the death cell there was a woman there who had come on crutches and she was uh, very poor and she had um, the crutches were also old and while i was standing there for an hour or so i kept seeing her then in the end one of the policemen uh, told her to come to me so when she came to me uh, i put down the window and in saraiki she says that e paise bhutto nen e paise bhutto nen so i looked at her and i said uh, but i mean in the urdu the mama bhutto to the nahi hai to she said nahi paise bhutto nahi so she opened up an envelope and uh, there was i think 1 lakh rupees which was a lot of money at that time and she said to me in saraiki that this is money which is for my hajj and uh, my son has earned this and this is bhutto's because he sent my son for for a job and you have to give a bakra for him and the plane is going to go from the mall i couldn't understand what uh, what she meant at that time and so i said ma sis matlab we can't give this money because bhutto hath hi paise na pahunche i looked up and i saw this car drive the jail gate opened and the car drove out and there was begum bhutto and benazir and benazir my eye met and for a flash but when i saw those big eyes full of they were red they were full of tears and within seconds it she conveyed to me through her eye that they're going to go ahead today I would like to mention April 5th 1979 BB was allowed one person and Begum Saiba was allowed one person and Begum put to ask for Fakhri and BB asked for me and we went on the plane and we went there to see them and it was well, I think one of the most horrible times of my life to see a wife and a daughter in that state to gadi khuda bakhsh put to it was so heartbreaking it was BB threw herself on her father's grave on the mud. She picked up the rose petals and put them on her face. Big Bhutto was sitting there. It's the saddest, one of the saddest moments of my life. Little did I know that I would see much worse later. Not once did the mother or the daughter ever say, I wish it had been otherwise. The first time uh, that they put her under arrest was in 1977 in Multan. She was 24 years old because while Bibi was in Sakar Jail, Begum Bhutto was in Karachi Central Jail. In that period, her sister got married, so they brought her for two days on parole to the house. She was there for the day, evening of the Mehndi, the next day of the Shadi, in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, they took her back to Karachi Central Jail, and she was so overwhelmed by all the people because she had been in solitary confinement. because begum bhutto also had been in karachi central jail but she became ill so they had to leave her when she was in sakhar jail 
Uh, I remember her telling me that in the morning when she would get up early morning, it used to be so hot that her feet would burn if she touched the floor. And she was all alone. And, you know, she came from a privileged background. For a young girl of a privileged background to be put into a jail, in a far, far off jail, without any access to anybody, it could not have been easy. But she always faced it beautifully. And I don't think anybody in this country, anybody, and I repeat, has that, any political leader or otherwise, has that kind of courage. Once she had a very difficult um, internment uh, in the house in Larkana. It was a house arrest, but it was very tough. It was very hot. It was, um, there was no electricity most of the time. There were no servants. And um, I had the good fortune of seeing her in that state because uh, she was allowed a cousin or two, female cousin or two, once in six months or something. And I went as one of those cousins in a burqa and somehow we got through the security and all, and I spent a week with her in that house arrest. And I saw her, she was so I mean, good at managing her time and herself, you know, which her father had also guided her about, but she was cooking for me in that heat in the kitchen. Then she was making milkshake for me, mango shake. Then she would go and do her yoga. I mean, she had a time for everything. You know, it was all timed out. She had a timetable. There were beautiful roses she was looking at in Larkana. She was looking after and they were in beautiful condition. Benazir, you know, there was this thing about her. When she took on something wholeheartedly, she was really good at it. So, I mean, those one week when I came out, I felt so great. I said, my God, look at her. I've come from outside and I felt jailed in one week. And this girl is taking it all the time with a sucker jail in the heat. Because, you know, her jail terms were not like the, some of the others who got a more lenient uh, time in jail. Hers was very, very strict. But when you look back on Bibi's life, after the traumatic uh, killing of her father, and when she was released and she was allowed to take a train journey to uh, Larkana, she took a train journey, she was allowed to travel and went from Karachi to Larkana on train. There were masses of people and throngs all over. And every time she stopped anywhere, that's, that was her theme, that, you know, you would defeat him at the ballot box, that it's the ballot box that's important. And even at that time, way back when she was 24, 25, uh, so she was a believer and I think that was the upbringing they had received in the environment in which she grew, and that was a very key factor, and she lived up to it. Elections took place after Ziaul Haq's fatal accident, and People's Party came in, unfortunately, not for long. The second elections in 1993 again provided a chance to the party, and some headway was made. Bibi's particular concern was the plight of the Pakistani women. Bibi was a very intelligent woman. She had a very uh, sharp vision, and she knew where she wanted to go, but she was never permitted, and her, her dreams were constantly interrupted. So that's why when she came the first time into power, the background was such that she was fighting a very retrogressive government. You know, for 10 years, they had brainwashed the bureaucracy and the intelligentsia. The establishment was against her. As you know, the IMF uh, condition had come just the day before. Ghulam Ishaq had accepted them. Then there were all these people against her. And after that, the first thing she did when she became PM, she visited the Ministry of Women Development. She started this bank. She said, I think it's very important for women to be economically uh, free, you know, independent. She said, I think that's very important. And she started this bank so that they could give, it was more of a development bank. Majority are women employees. Then she said that because of the way our women are treated, you know, in, in the criminal sense, there's no real criminal justice system here at the lower level. So that's why she got this idea of police, women police thanas. As the first woman ever elected to head an Islamic nation, I feel a special responsibility towards women's issues and towards all women. We in Pakistan have started a public awareness campaign against domestic uh, violence through the mass media to inform women that domestic violence is a crime and to alert and warn men that they can be punished for it. Today, more women suffer than men from poverty, deprivation, and discrimination. Half a billion women are illiterate. 
70% of the children who are denied elementary education in the world are girls. And that is why we in Pakistan are focusing on primary education for girls. We are concentrating on training women teachers and opening up employment avenues for women. It is my firm conviction that a woman cannot ultimately control her life and make her own choices unless she has financial independence. And a woman cannot have financial independence if she cannot work. The discrimination against women can only begin to erode when women are educated and when women are employed. If my father had not educated me or left me with independent financial means, I would not have been able to sustain myself or to struggle against tyranny or to say to stand here before you as a special guest speaker. She was there 20 months. So you have to remember it's not eight or ten years. But she initiated these things and women judges, because she said they should be, because she genuinely believed, like Kaide Azam, that women should fight shoulder to shoulder with men. That was her, her motto, and even her father's motto was that. I remember the Zainab Noor case, which she took up. She was horrified. She went running there. And, you know, she sent her abroad. They spent about 50,000 pounds on her because she said, I must make an example. And they put the husband in jail. Even besides that, I remember for 20 years, you know, when I was doing, as a political activist, when I was moving around with her and working with her, out of government also, wherever I went, whichever forum they would talk about CEDO, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination with Women, and that was a UN charter, as you know, the Bill of Rights for Women. So we'd signed CEDO and we ratified CEDO. Not only signed it, we ratified it and sent in April 96. We sent it to the UN legal office, affairs office or whatever. And of course the follow-up has to be done. Look, we did, she did initiate a lot of things. She had a lot of things still on her mind and which we had recorded among ourselves and said we are going to do this and that. But you know, you need the time. This is a country you're talking about. You're not... <laughs> When you put your own house in order, if it's burnt down, it takes you about two years. So this is, you're talking about a country. She was so concerned about population because she felt this country cannot, you know, we keep knocking on doors and saying, we'll do this, we'll improve education. No, nothing will get to it. I mean, it's a very good uh, beginning, but for God's sake, unless you control, she used to say, unless you control your population, what are you going to do? Your schools will be full, your transport will not be available, there's no water, no electricity. So she was very keen and she used to warn her MPAs and MNAs. I remember she used to tell them, I won't give you development funds unless you go in every constituency and when you're talking to the people about other issues, you must bring in this concept of population control. And that's why she started also that uh, lady health worker scheme. That was quite a success, and I wish they had carried out with all that zeal because initially they were supposed to take like about a lakh uh, women. And I used to say that because when I saw some of them before training, six weeks training with UNICEF and other organizations, and after that training, I was amazed at the difference. Women parliamentarians from Muslim countries. She initiated because she talked to the Irani um, Rafsanjani's daughters and they were very keen also and then she took this idea to the other OIC countries and they were very very enthusiastic about it and she did have that. In sports Yaul Haq had banned all national women sports and international sports. We, we opened that and we wanted to encourage. Then she started this women Islamic sports Iran Kisa. You know this, she, they started this thing and that was such a hit. It was such a hit that when I was representing her at the um, Olympic International Committee, they had their first meeting ever of women in sports. And there we had all these Olympian champions, old and new, from all over the world coming to me and saying, look, I believe you are having this, and you know, Benazir is there, and we want to come as observers. And we 
used to go on tours, we used to see masses of kids running with her car and waving to her. And that really endeared her more and more. And she said, look at that. They shouldn't be on the streets. At this time, they should be in school, you see? And that is something she was very strict about, uh, education. Polio immunization campaign, health sector allocation increase. Because of personal interest, she held the health portfolio. She started that and she gave drops to Bakhtabar. I remember it was Bakhtabar who was born at that time and she gave drops to her and she went personally to a lot of places. And because, you know, illness takes away a lot of our children in inf when they are little infants. But she was amazing. Even when she was having her children, she had full work days, full work days. And I remember when Bilawal was born and I went into her room and she was back in her room and she, she could hear people chanting outside and she's saying, Sammy, what are they saying? And I said, I went to the window and I heard and I said, they are saying, Kal bhi bhutto zinda tha, aaj bhi bhutto zinda hai. All the Bhutto children have this, this uh, very Bhutto trait. It's this connection that they have with the people, which is amazing. It's, there's uh, no effort. It's with effortless ease that they connect with uh, the constituency of the rejected, with the common man. They can be one moment with an intellectual of a different background, and the next moment they can be in the fields, in the, in the bazaars, connecting with the, the poor. And this is something that uh, I think Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto imbibed in all his children and it's something that came down to them. Um, it was in the genes, it was something that no effort was put into. Bhattuism has always impressed me, has always attracted me in one way or another. Bhattu Saab actually gave a vision which Mohtarma carried forward according to the new era and the new times. She was a source of inspiration for every one of us. During her tenure, media played an active role in highlighting the concerns affecting women through talk shows and plays. To ensure this positive portrayal of women, Bibi appointed a woman as the first managing director of Pakistan Television, who had a broad vision and opened the field to enterprising creative people. I remember there was some tractor scheme. Now this tractor they put on a field and they had made it all ready for posing. They said, Prime Minister, you get onto the tractor and you just need to sit. You don't need to do anything. And she said, Sammy, aren't you coming? And I said, well, you know, there's no place on the tractor for me. I'll stand aside. So what happens? She turns the key and off she goes. The tractor was up PJ again. And they were all running after it. It was so funny because I know her. I knew she would do it, but I just kept quiet because nothing deterred my friend. I mean, God bless her. She was amazing. Nothing stopped her. She would... I think she's a woman in a million and there's so many facets to a personality whether as a sister, as a wife, as a daughter, as a uh, friend. Even as a friend, she never changed from the time I befriended her. It could have been when she was 23, 25, 40. Uh, she always greeted you the same way. She sort of hugged you, kissed you. She could be sitting in the PM house or she could be sitting in, uh, in our own home. But the tone never changed. I mean, the friendships remained the same. She would ask, how are the children? How so and so? What are they doing? I mean, took a lot of interest in everybody's lives. And, and then I got married to her cousin. Uh, my mother-in-law, uh, which was her puppy, got sick. And my mother-in-law went into a coma. But she was very close to her. So uh, when we came back from England, when we flew her back, she was at the Khan Hospital and uh, baby was prime minister. So she called me and she said to me that night, she asked me that, um, how is Auntie Manna doing? So I said, she's not very well right now and the doctors are saying the countdown has begun and she said, oh no. And um, this must have been around 11, 30, 12. And then I kept waiting and while I was around 2.30, I was watching out of the Aachan window and I suddenly saw like cars driving up and like a cavalcade and you know, like little cars shining. and. And I looked up and I said, could it be? And I said, no. And, and anyway, while I was just thinking of all this, while she came up, I suddenly saw that Benazir had arrived with her ADC, everybody, and she'd brought my mother with her. And I mean, I just broke down. I thought, you know, when she's got so much on her plate right now, to come to be with us at a moment which was like, it was like, you know, like we're life going away. And... Uh, paid tremendous homage to her, her father's side of the family. 
and to actually say farewell and to be with us. I mean, she never, I mean, she was there for everybody. And then sometimes we look at the pain she must have gone through. But she came for me, she came for Tariq, she came for her puppy to bid her farewell. When uh, she was getting married and she said, I have to have uh, a function with the people because, you know, I, I can't not have the people at my wedding. So it was decided that she will, there'll be a wedding uh, reception at uh, Kakri ground in Liari. And she said, me now, should I wave to the crowds or should I not wave to the crowds? What should I do? And I said, your instinct. You've never been wrong. I've known you all my life. You follow your instinct. So when she went there and she was looking so beautiful in her white shalwar kameez, she got on the stage and then she went waving to all the crowds and they all started clapping and then made us, all her friends who never sung publicly ever anything, made us sing a song. And then in 2007, she came and conquered the hearts of the people once again. A reflective and thoughtful Benazir wanted to start afresh. The last time I met uh, Motarma Benazir Bhutto was uh, in November, middle of November or so. Uh, that day she was also released from house arrest and so was I. I went to see her. But we felt that we had not talked enough. And so she said, now I'll come and see you. The same day she came after dinner and in the meanwhile we had invited some human rights people, some lawyers, some journalists. And it was a very lively debate because many people who were there were not convinced by that time that Motarma should actually go for elections. But with great patience, after taking a lot of criticism and questions, she was able to convince them. She was able to tell them why she wanted to go in. And I cannot forget some of her words. She said, my workers, people from my party, Political activists and civil society have suffered so much in this country. They have given so much blood shed. I don't want them anymore to continue to agitate. Let's try and make a transition without bloodshed. Little did she know that it would be her blood that would take for this very fragile trans transition. And then naturally when she was in power, uh, we would always... Uh, criticize her for not doing enough for women. I think I'm so happy that that day when she was meeting us and we didn't know it was the last time, we were able to tell her of the things that she did do. For example, she was the first prime minister of this country or a, a, a politician of this country that placed women in superior judiciary. She brought in many health workers in every commission whether it was Women's Commission or uh, Law Commission or Minorities Commission, she always had women there. And most importantly, she opened up the media. I have not been in PTV or Radio Pakistan before her government. During the, this period of exile, I think she delivered hundreds of lectures in different parts of the world, America and all over. While we were in Jada, she always kept me engaged in working for the, on different welfare projects. Either is were giving free education, adopting orphan students, or tuberculosis patients. Their treatments, nobody have ever known that part of her life. That how quietly she used to help many people for their treatment, for their education, in their hard times. As a mother, she was amazing. She would read the surah of the Quran with them and then they used to go for Friday prayers and they used to discuss things. She would discuss the whole week with the children. And then in the evening she had kept her time aside to be with the kids, 6.30 to 8. Bibi's religious religion was uh, 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 not the kind of religion that uh, you perceive or the religion that is associated with the fundamentalist or the rightist. It was a very Sufi religion. And if you go to the rural areas of Pakistan, especially of Sindh, there's a lot of Sufism. So her religion was, yes, her faith in God was very uh, deeply entrenched. And uh, she 
but it was again a very Sufi way of life, a very Sufi form of religion than uh, the sort of uh, conventional religion that you perceive. My father was the in charge of Prime Minister House Prachi and Larkana. He is a civil engineer. So all my childhood, I saw either 70 Clifton or Al Murtaza. And in 1999, I joined the school that was founded by her in Saudi Arabia, Jadda. And that was a new era of our relationship. I discovered a new part of Benazir, a new, her interest in education, her interest in religion. I said to her once, as Bibi, don't come back. We love you very much. We don't want to lose you, and they won't spare you. And she nodded and smiled, and she knew the uh, risks and dangers that were inherent in the situation. But it's something she could not de-link herself from the people. She, she loved her country. She loved this land. She loved the soil. She could not. She is not one of those people who could live in exile. And she had to wait, I guess, for an opportune, opportune moment when her children were old enough or going to universities, her husband was out of jail, that at least one parent was there to look after the children. So as soon as that opportunity presented herself, she came back. She came back knowing that she may not come out alive of the situation. And that's why she was fatalistic. She knew the forces that she was up against. So, uh, yes, she knew that there was real danger lurking in the background. When we were returning back after performing Umrah, she was very happy. I could see a glow on her face. It seems that she has gained a spiritual strength. And at that time, I could see that glow was her determination. That glow was her decision for going back home. At that time, her shahada was already, I think, confirmed at that time because you could never see that glow ever on anyone's face. She ruled the heart of the people. She is still hope, not only in Pakistan. She represented the women all over the world. Each and every eye cried for her. She must have prayed Allah to let her serve her country in her last breath and let her sacrifice her life for her country, her beloved Pakistan. Are these the same roses that I wanted to lay on her way to receive her? और आज मैं यहाँ खड़ी ये सोच रही हूँ क्या ये वो ही गुलाब हैं जो मैंने बीबी के रास्ते पे बिछाने थे जो मैंने उनके कदमों पे निखावर करने थे